Andy, I'm an oddity as a podcast host that I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, my auditory processing isn't the best. So I read voraciously. Yeah. However, however, I was highly recommended by a friend to listen to your podcast episode with Jordan Harbinger, who's a mm. friend. Oh, um, I'm great, grateful to call him a friend. And yeah. I listened to it. I actually think I listened to like half of it and then had a son who's, we, we had discussions around this, had a son in the car. So we started over and listened to the whole thing again. And bottom line, I listened I, and I thought, I, I want more. I, I, want, I want to go deeper. And so right. that's why I pursued you. That's why you're here. Thanks for being with me. Fantastic. Well, any friend of Jordan's a friend of mine and uh, happy to chat about it. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. I look at him as a podcasting uh, mentor uh, quite a bit and just, uh, uh, yeah, such a good guy. So, you know, I, I have poured through your book, Andy, honestly, I poured through it. I pondered, I talked about it with friends. I mean, your, your show with Jordan came out, I think it was November of last year. Um, something Sounds like that. Right. So it's, it's been a, been a little while. And so just some big ticket topics came to mind and I thought, man, I, I want to pick your brain. And yeah. the first, the first premise really here is, you know, as I'm, I'm thinking about this and think about, imagine someone who's just a happy go lucky, no worries type of person. They're just, everything's good. Don't need to control anything. That's, mm -hmm. you know, a construct Their Their answer to everything is basically, you know, whatever, who cares? I'm just, I'm just floating out here. That's not most people, obviously yeah. it doesn't exist. I mean, it seems like from birth, we are trying to find security and yeah. we do it through control. And it feels like, and what you got me thinking on that we pursue this control by deciding and orienting ourselves around belief, which we inherently think those beliefs are fact. Mm -hmm. And here we are. And yet, as you, as what I extrapolated out, we are just products of a lot of what we've just been exposed to. We've accepted and adopted and we believe those are fact and it feels like this is where we've gone awry and that's what you're picking apart. Yeah. So the psychologists have this notion of identity, protective cognition, fancy, fancy word, but wow. it, okay. the basic idea is that, um, you know, we need to protect our sense of who we are. And a lot of times what that does is sets up conflicts with new information that is challenging. Or the new so new information comes in it doesn't sit easily with your sense of who you are what do you do do you do you revise your sense of who you are or do you block out the information um we struggle with this kind of challenge all the time and there's a bigger problem which is how do you what what information do you take seriously and let change you and what information do you reject as harmful or false or, or misleading and, it, and I argue in the book that uh, our minds actually have highly evolved Im immune systems that function to protect our minds the same way our body's immune systems protect our bodies. And how do you, I mean, looking at belief, which I know is in your book, it's almost like section two is all about, you know, you start with belief and that's really where I, I mean, I chimed in with it all, but hit on that and and again, you got me thinking just about the core premise of belief. Why do we, and I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hand as somebody who does as well. Why do we, why do I have such a need to have these staunch beliefs that I kind mm -hmm. of inherently feel are fact. And if they're challenged, I want them to be fact, but why do I need it? it wait, I, I guess the first question is control at, is that fair to say that that's at the root of it? Yeah. Um, see if this, I think that's part of it. Let's see if this adds to that. Um, so each of us needs to build kind of a, a map of the world in yeah. our minds um, or a model of reality. Um, and the, the information that we compile and encode as belief is kind of like our, our mental map of the world. Yeah. Um, and because it's gotten us this far, we tend to rely on it. We want to trust it. We we have faith in it to a certain degree. And it's and when new disturbing information comes along and says, you know what, there's something wrong with the way you're thinking about this, often we get defensive and reject the new information, even if we could learn from it. If so if it does 
I like that. A map. It's the, it's the map we have. It's the construct we have. It's somewhat of our security. If we look at today, my opinion, looking out at the culture is we seem to feel more out of control than ever. And if yeah. you look, yeah, if you look at the stats and anxiety and worry, to me, that speaks of mm-hmm. a lack of control. If that's the case, is our gut reaction to grasp more for beliefs? That makes that makes wonderful sense to me. I, I like the way you put that too. I, I think we, we live in turbulent times uh, and with a hugely influential new information technology, thinking of the internet, just changing the rules of just about every game in town, the world feels out of control. And in a world like that, you've got some people who are trying to rapidly modify their mental maps yeah. so as to adapt to the new reality. And you've got other people clinging more tightly to the beliefs they have saying, no, no, no. Um, um, these beliefs have worked for me. I don't like this new reality. It, it feels, and, and just there, you pointed out, that feels, and my experience again is, and I've done this, is that we tend to polarize. We're either on that side of, I mean, my gosh, I come from the Bible belt uh, in, in a big way. And there it is black and white, you know, it is certainty and, and more rigid. This is what I grew up in. And mm-hmm. you really lambast the other side of just, oh, anything goes, but it's both polarized. And I find myself now at my age and my own evolution and looking and go, I think those are both just drastically off base. Where's the middle ground? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there, there are definitely unhealthy extremes at, at both ends here. Um, so one, you, I, I have friends who joke that, uh, uh, you know, you, we need to have open minds, but my, but not so open that our brains fall out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, another way to put the tension is that if we're, uh, if we're 100% responsive to new information, then we just change our beliefs at the drop of a hat and we never... S- develop a, a sense of stability or or um or i or, or really a stable identity fail to learn when, when when learning is required and so how do you how do you strike that that healthy balance and the book is all about so so actually we can learn a lot here from the body's immune system so the body's immune system also has to walk this tightrope. Um, it has to let in nutrients and good bacteria, but it has to identify the really harmful bacteria, the, the really harmful uh, parasites, and try to knock them out. Yeah. And it, our minds have to do the same thing. We have to let in good information. We have to let in truths, and we have to block out harmful information and falsehoods. But, but how trusting should we be? If we're super trusting, then a lot of falsehoods flood in. Yeah. If we're super suspicious, we end up blocking out a lot of, a lot of, tr- uh, a lot of truths. So hitting on that, actually, I got to come to that word truth. So to trickle down to that, again, looking at the culture right now, it feels like, well, as you said, I mean, we're, we're in a new, you and I are as not non-digital natives, you know, new world. And we're, yeah. we're pummeled with information, information overload, media news, opinion uh, overload. And what has struck me, maybe since COVID, maybe since things have gotten, you know, COVID and then, and then racial issues came up and things seem to get, you know, and then presidency and to get even more volatile. And what struck me, maybe with my kids somewhat, I've got adult kids and some of the questions and topics that we talk about, and to realize the pressure that I perceive that there is that one, we as a people know about every issue out there. You, mm-hmm. you have some knowledge, insight, and really the pressure to, you should know enough to have an opinion and you should be very staunch upon that opinion. And, and honestly, yeah, it was Andy, it was COVID. And I was doing a show with uh, uh, my buddy I co-host with a lot, Dr. Randy James, he's a medical doctor and a functional medicine expert. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about COVID and, you know, vaccines yeah. and whatnot. So he's the doc, right? So tell us what to do. And he's saying, man, 
and this came from a personal conversation initially. He says, look, I, I have these people that I know who are in the field yeah. and this guy is 100% vaccine and makes a great case. And I respect the guy. And he's, again, he's in the, he's the guy researching it. He's like, I'm not, I'm here at a local practice. I'm this guy is, yeah. and I've got another guy over here that I also respect so much. And he's in the field and he's saying, absolutely not. Wow. And he says, here I am in the practice. I'm not researching. And, I'm so, and my patients are asking me and they sure as heck don't want to hear. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we, we exactly. Well, especially when we're dealing with something scary and sure. potentially fatal, right? Sure. Um, uncertainty makes most of us deeply uncomfortable. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's, right? un, it's, un, uh, it's, it's not hip. I mean, you are just, if you're uncertain, you're ignorant. It feels like. Well, and and just brash confidence and bravado often comes across as higher status. Now, I, I, I trained as a philo philosopher, and philosophers ask tons and tons of really hard questions to the point where they start to doubt everything. And 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 then we and we sometimes philosophers are too far in the direction of of hypercritical thinking. Yeah. Um, but a good bit of the world, I think is insufficiently critical, right? Or, or uncritical thinking is also a huge problem in our society. So um, the book is all about how to strike the, the, a healthy balance uh, between trust and suspicion, between um, uh, openness and, and, and fixity and, or, or uh, c continuity. Well, and I struggle with certainty that you are to look at the options out there, which it feels like today, every option is one of two very opposing sides, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about COVID or uh, uh, abortion or politics or whatnot, it's either you're either one side or the other, there's no middle ground. And you're supposed to base your chosen, I'm going to say, cho you know, chosen belief, because it's, it's not an objective truth, necessarily, your yeah. chosen belief. And you are supposed to stand in certainty because as you said, if you're uncertain, that's uncomfortable. And I would say it lacks social credibility these days because it's a lot more ego fulfilling you know, to be staunch on it as, if, as yeah. if you have become an expert. Yeah. And, and if you look at history through this lens, what you find is that there are times when certainty and uh, is so valued that people become highly dogmatic. Yeah. And, and then... Uh, that society can kind of spiral into, uh, you know, factionalism or, or spiral into just degrade, uh, superstition can flourish in, yeah. in highly dogmatic times. Um, so the, what philosophers have said for a long time is that we all need to become more comfortable with uncertainty so yeah. that we don't overreact um, and freak out when people start raising questions. Um, it, the, the process of testing our ideas with questions, exploring the areas of, of the areas of uncertainty and and actually making your peace with the uncertainty that we're stuck with anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's an enormously helpful process that can help us become more humble um, and sort of better calibrate, I think, our mental maps to the world because it to be unduly confident it, that can come back and bite you in the rear right yeah. um i mean imagine it, it, imagine being so confident that you could cross the pacific ocean on a in a canoe that you head out boldly right yeah it's not probably not going to go well yeah um so underconfidence can be a problem but overconfidence can too and i've, I've got a good friend who teaches that the um, in the business school at, at Berkeley, he's just written a book about how to calibrate your confidence correctly. Right? That's great. Huh. And uh, we we uh, we definitely uh, you know we read each other's books and then bought each other beers and and talked about how 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 our respective views uh, dovetail in some really interesting ways. Um, but he, he's way smarter than I am, so I figure I'm <laughs> heading in the right direction. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you talk about that uh, going across the ocean in a, in a canoe. I mean, we would look at that. And again, I, I'm going to refer back to my own 
upbringing and the concept of absolute truths were, were talked about a lot, especially in a religious context. But you know, I can take those today and say, okay, if you're dropped in the middle of the ocean out of a helicopter, dead in the middle, I mean, you're pretty much going to die. I mean, it's just not much getting around that. If you're left in Antarctica naked by the you know few hours, you're going to be gone. If you jump off a thousand foot cliff, the chances of your survival are so, okay. That's generally not what we're talking about. I, I see very little absolute truth as topics that are out there in the media, in the culture that we're talking about. Instead, yeah. we come back to, again, the title, or no, the, the, the first line of your tagline of your book, infectious ideas. They are ideas that we are. So we've got an idea right now and, and I'm not looking to get, you know, into a debate, but if we look at the, the, the recent abortion um, issue, we have, here, here it is. And we have people on one side with an idea mm-hmm. and we have people on the other side with an idea. Yeah. We all look at that. We choose which one we align with and say, that's what I believe. And then take the stance of fact. Well, and, and there's an alternative to okay. that, which is to kind of go into the question, what, what is really a deeply, a, a very deep moral question. So, so think about this, right? Um, an unwanted pregnancy brings the interests of the mother and the interests of the fetal life within them into, into great tension and the woman's right to do with she will with her body and the fetus's right to life are are I mean, the life and and freedom are two of our deepest values and they're and they come into really interesting conflict in the case of unwanted pregnancy so rather than just map out a position and go in swinging well instead we can go in and say wow you know this issue's probably got a whole lot more depth than i imagined why don't I go in with an open mind and see what I can learn from this person who's coming at it from another angle? So when I taught applied ethics for the first time, I did a module on the ethics of abortion. And basically you read a bunch of articles. You, I assigned a bunch of articles from the pro-life perspective and I assigned a bunch of articles from the, the pro-choice perspective. And what's fascinating is that really thoughtful people on both sides can teach us things. And if you go in willing to learn from both sides, you end up with a much more nuanced um, view of of right and wrong. What you end up with is is a view with far fewer absolutes, but but more shades of gray, right? And and if if we all did that, our society would, if we were all comfortable doing that, our society would be a whole lot less polarized and, and our existence as a nation would be would be on much firmer ground because right now polarization is threatening the very uh continuation of america and it's part in part because we've forgotten how to have a respectful dialogue with people who disagree with us i appreciate you saying that that you know you're going to learn from people on both sides i think if we took the most you know not not just i don't want to say staunch i keep using that word but you know two people who really advocate yeah. The opposite sides on abortion, just as you said, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about two lives, a, a mother and a baby. And my sense is, well, you talk about this in the book, when we get down to brass tacks, if we stuck those two people in a, a stranded elevator and, uh, and they had a mutual you know, fight for their own lives in there, that as they sit there in the dark and talk to each other, they probably have more similarities than not and mm-hmm. more of the same values and that they are both so concerned and caring about the sanctity of both life of, of life period. Let's just say yeah. they are both there with the same value of life. They're seeing it from a little different angle, mm-hmm. but is it really that different? Well, and when you take the time to have these deep conversations with people who differ from you, you end up discovering that, that you do have much more common ground than it, than, than it appeared at first. So when you have, ideological polarization and people just um, point fingers and demonize across the political divide or across a religious divide, um, you, we tend to start stereotyping and dehumanizing one another. Yeah. Um, and, and we lose the ability to think in nuanced ways. And we've watched our society grow more and more polarized in recent yeah. decades. And unfortunately, we're, we're we're depriving ourselves of learning opportunities when we gravitate to 
the people who just, if we just hang out in our echo chambers, our, our, our worldviews become kind of rigid and inflexible and we become disdainful of other points of view, even when we've still got a lot to learn ourselves. You, you got me thinking, Andy, during some of your book of the exercise, and I actually had some of my kids, you know, in mind, which, which we have great conversations. There's not, we're not polarized, but we, we enjoy talking about these things to say, let's take the side that you believe in that you do side with and let you make an argument. If it's the most compelling argument, you just win. You proved your point. I'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars though. If you can argue the other side and win, you know, kind of like a school project. And I'd be so interested to see people if they had the motive to, like you said, we put a tangible motive on it to actually consider and try to make a case. What would it do for the other side? For the other side, but I, then I, I still wonder to your point too of uh, or discussion on uncertainty. I have found that at my age, I'm 51. I have far, far less certainty than ever. Maybe yeah. like you said, if you if philosophize too much, um, but to some degree, I, I do fall in that. Though I feel wiser, I feel wiser in my own decisions, in my own lifestyle and fulfillment and the things that I feel like give more life than death. I feel wiser. But if you ask me about a certain thing and I'd like to be hip with the kids and have this, you know, the rigid view, but I just, I just don't, I have a lot of like on that, on abortion, man, I've got a lot of compassion for both sides. Yeah. I, well, that I, shows moral in my mind, that shows moral growth and it should okay. be something you can take pride in, even if it makes it hard to issue decisive declarations that, that, uh, you know, draw bright lines. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've come to really like you, I guess, over time, I've come to appreciate subtlety and gray areas and nuance. And, um, and I think, well, the, the, and there's no question in my mind that wisdom tries to acquire all of those where it's required. Yeah. And that it's the province of the largely foolish to just cling to simple answers that are that you have to be almost willfully blind to to hang on to which is what certainty reeks of to me in a lot of these issues and and so to hit on that when we look at gosh this concept of the beliefs have to be yeah black and white so staunch and right or wrong and i feel like and again i'm going to point to my own uh, religious background that I question so much of the aspects of right or wrong. Why do we have to go there? I don't see it providing fruit. I don't see it helping anyone. I don't see it providing peace, fulfillment, love even. And yet, and yet Andy, I also struggle with it. So, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the health and wellness industry and I so much want to say, look, good God, people, fast food and processed food is not going to help you. It is not going to help you have a sustainable life and, and not have Alzheimer's and park, you know, it's not going to help. Yeah. Um, and, and whole foods and veggies will. And I used to, we used to play around and just kind of the, the joke was, you know, a carrot or a hot pocket. You know what? A carrot is just black and white fact better. It's right. And a hot pocket's <laughs> wrong. And then my buddy, the doc, you know, Randy, he's saying, well, not if you're starving in the desert, man, that hot pocket is life. He's, okay. He's got, he's got a point there, right? And, and there, and is that where you see the, 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 the frustration, I guess, or the problem with having to set everything as this polarized, not only good, bad, but literally a right or a wrong. Yeah. I mean, so as somebody who's philosophers are really interested in moral questions, questions of right and wrong and good yeah. and bad and, knowledge versus mere opinion all the, these are the questions philosophers spend a lot of time on i i think I, I admire greatly the religions that try to bring ourselves back to the central moral questions what really matters right and it's not enough to just go through life focusing only on the facts we also have to think about what's important we have to think about what what's right and what's wrong and uh to the extent that religions keep us attuned to questions of right and wrong and asking questions about that i think they're a force for a wonderful force for good when religions kind of give us 
pat black and white answers and say, don't ask any more questions, just take it on faith, then the religion becomes, I think, an obstacle to moral growth because it's harder to keep deepening and complexifying your worldview if you're told you have to cling or hang on to certain articles of faith, regardless of what you might learn from the evidence or what you might learn from somebody on the other side. Well, your question there, Andy, I mean, what really matters? That's, that's an acute question. Uh, and if we look at religion, what really matters standing on what you believe is right or wrong and trying to prove that prove you're right, prove they're wrong or loving someone well, regardless. And you we're getting into deep water. Uh, In some ways, what, what really matters is what is one of the deepest questions there is that uh, I've done some work on this in uh in, in the world of philosophy, where, where we try to clarify what that question is really asking for and what it would take to answer it in a way that is satisfying. Um, uh, I, I think that if you adopt a scientific outlook on the universe, and um, then it turns out that the well-being of conscious creatures is ultimately what matters. Mm -hmm. Um, so th think about a universe with just rocks and space dust and ask yourself if rearranging the rocks and the space dust could possibly make that universe the least bit better or worse. All right. All right. The answer is, nah, probably not. But if there's a critter in that universe that can either uh, experience more or less well-being as a result of the rearrangement of things, then you then better and worse, good and bad, enter the picture. Yeah. And because we're creatures that evolved uh, to thrive under certain conditions and 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 die and and suffer under other conditions, that's what makes some things good and other things bad. And and if we take that outlook seriously, I think we can actually generate something like an actual science of what matters. This is going to be my next book, but uh, oh, really, uh, okay. I haven't thought this through fully, but. Um, I, I think that it's only a conventional understanding of science's limits. I, I think there's a fairly arbitrary obstacle to expanding the purview of science to one where we can actually think together in, in semi-scientific ways about what really matters. I mean, the, the issue is, I guess at the heart of it, because if we take somebody and ask them and audit, why do you believe what you believe? I would think that at least at face value, they would say, because they do feel like it is best. It serves people best. If we look at, again, from a basic health and wellness standpoint, we can look at, you know, diet, exercise, whatever, and just say what activities, behaviors are statistically, we can look at the numbers more life-giving and what, okay, go. Well, well, beautiful point, and and I want to come back to your carrot or hot pocket, uh, yeah, uh, question. Uh, if you just ask your cravings which to go for, you'll choose the hot pocket almost right. every time. Right. But if you actually set, tell yourself, if you remind yourself that your desires don't, our desires don't always steer us right. And say, you know what, this is a job for my rational mind. This is a, a, a job that I have to take, um, I have to think about the statistics. I have to think about the, the long-term health implications of these things. Then you come back, you're likely to come back with a different question and maybe reach for that carrot. Um, going all the way back to the beginnings of Western philosophy, uh, you know, philosophers have thought about, you know, what, what do you do if your desires pull one pull you one direction? but reason or rationality pulls you the opposite direction, yep. <laughs> right? Um, and I think it's clearly not right to always just cave to your, to your desires. That can lead to a lot of hedonistic, um, selfish, um, short-term, right? Our, if you go for, reach for the hot pocket every time, you're, you maybe experience more pleasure in the short term, but worse, worse health outcomes in the long term. Those are the trade-offs, and our minds actually have modules. Some of them represent the long our long-term interests, and other mind modules represent our short-term interests. <laughs> and a lot of times, there's a tug of war between them. 
Well, and when you say that, Andy, so talking about desires, that one, honestly, I, the best word I've got, it, it haunts me. Uh, even looking at my own, looking at myself, looking at the mirror and realizing that sometimes I, I, I don't have confidence. I can really step outside my own confirmation bias. Is it yeah. really possible for me to do that with as much wisdom and self-awareness as I may want to have? Can I do that? Because I'm trying to, and I'm trying to at least just be honest and go, you know what? I would really like to take all the articles that say wine is good and health giving and elevate those because I really just want to have wine period. Yeah. Same thing with coffee. I really don't yeah. care to see the next study that says coffee's bad. I want to see one that says it's I'm, I'm right there with you, buddy. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I, I hear you on that. And dark chocolate. I just, it just should be a proven fact that it is, <laughs> it's good for you. So I, I, I do, I mean, I totally, I totally want those, but then if you look at the research, I really can't make a case, I, honestly, for any of those I've unfortunately dug in enough and thought, you know what? I can't. So at these, this point, not I, even the coffee, Kevin, I just, you know, oh, come tell, say it ain't so. I'm not, I'm not, we'll just call this a hypothetical discussion. And <laughs> You know, but I, I do want to do those. And now I look at them and go, you know what? I just am going to do those things in moderation. Uh, I don't want to hurt myself, but I just enjoy them. I'm not going to make a case for them, but you get into these other more volatile issues. And it comes back to your aspect on belief of the, I'm going to say this, my paraphrase, but the, I don't know if you said this, but the, I, I extrapolated the danger that again, my paraphrasing, the reality is most of our beliefs we have very acutely tied to our identity and mm. therefore we cannot see clearly. And I think that's why I was, I was really hit with your show with Jordan. Cause when I heard that it gave me pause, Andy, and it, it, yeah. so it's not just that we have to learn not to treat our desires as gospel. We have yeah. to learn to not to treat our identities as gospel. That's right. and that's big medicine there. That's I had no I'm almost never, go ahead. I've never quite framed it quite that way before. I, I like the way you're well, it's I just it's it's so uh, well, you, I you you you've read it. I mean, I've read stuff on you and and heard some things. And when we take that belief, and I realize that I want that belief to be true because one, it is a part of my desire, or I may have just had also an acute experience where it was true to where, you know, a guy had a hot pocket and died and, and it was a dear friend of mine. And for the love of God, I'm going to save every, the whole world from a hot pocket. And then here's, you know, Randy over here. He says, man, I gave a hot pocket to a guy that saved his life. Well, and we're on two opposing sides and there is not a right or wrong, but we did have an experience that's valid and we have a, an emotional attachment to, and it's really hard to disassociate from. Well, and, and it helps to remember that, you know, the world is really complicated. In fact, it's yeah. way more complicated than any one of us can can imagine, probably. And, you know, a, a COVID vaccine might make, might save some, one person's life and it might make somebody else sick, right? The COVID, yeah. sorry, COVID itself can, can kill one person, but leave another person asymptomatic. And it turns out that the reality of, of an epidemic disease like COVID is so complicated that even the, the best scientific thinkers who are working their butts off to gain a nuanced understanding of these yeah. phenomena, they're still coming up with approximations and guesses. Totally, and, yeah. And, and um, you know, and, and in some cases, half-truths. A lot, Most of the time, those half-truths are better than our gut, than our uninformed gut level uh, in, instincts. But that doesn't mean they're the final word on the subject. And and we've seen Anthony Fauci um, have to walk back things all the time. To me, that's a sign that he takes evidence seriously and that he has in the kind of integrity that scientists look for. When new evidence comes in, scientists say, I guess I need to rethink things. Well, your statement there just on the complexity of life, to me, also speaks to uh, a root issue of this. I I'll speak for myself. I want black and white because it just makes my day more efficient, period. It makes my life more efficient. I don't have to stop and think. I did a show recently with uh, Tyler uh, Merritt, who yeah. is a, you know, Tyler? Uh, I, I don't, but 
I'm tre- I'm intrigued. Keep going. Okay. Well, and you know, so he's uh, you know six foot three, uh, black man with dreadlocks, and, and 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 he talks on stereotyping and marginalization, and we got into that discussion there. That st- to make a stereotype makes life efficient. So if you are alone on a back out, you know, or on a street, I should say, late at night, and you see a certain person who looks a certain way. Um, you may stereotype just for quickness, stereotype and go to the other, you know, you go in a shop or go to the other side of the street just to save time, as opposed to the complexity, which would say, maybe I should get to know that person and understand them and find out that like Tyler, even though he may look a certain way, he's one of the sweetest, warmest hearted people you'll ever find on the planet, but that takes time and investment. Yeah. It's complex, yeah. as you said, as opposed no. to taking the time to consider, which is really what I feel like in so many ways you're calling us to. Well, and and in scary times, the stereotypes seem to offer us safety, right? So if 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 you can shut out the immigrants, um, then it you feel safer. Yeah. Um, because who knows that the immigrants may be making life here less less safe. Um, you know, demagogues have appealed to anti-immigrant sentiment for all for for centuries um, and it, it often end up appealing to, to our fearful, to the worst in human nature when they do that. Um, so I, I think uh, people who take careful judicious thinking seriously have always pushed back against xenophobes and, and demagogues. And a lot of times they've ended up in the crosshairs. Yeah. <laughs> demagogues, yeah. xenophobes. Were you, you know, as you talk about you know, infectious ideas and mind parasites and the things that we hear, we're influenced by the ideas that we adopt, then you speak a lot to propaganda. And that's a big buzzword for me, Andy. I actually have uh, and, and have marked up the heck out of, uh, and go back to a lot, Edward Bernays book propaganda. I mean, he's yeah. the guy folks, if you don't know him, he's the guy that really took propaganda and media and helped increase smoking. And then it was some of his structure, I guess, of propaganda that helped us kind of get rid of smoking as well, but it was propaganda. It wasn't based on yeah. a lot of science, at least as far as out there in public opinion. And this is what's gotten me, Andy, and you brought me, uh, you kind of helped me understand a little more or think through it a little more is that here we are as I'm just a peasant out here. You know, what do I have expertise in? Not a lot of any of the topic. If I look at the main news headlines today, what do I, what have I really invested my time and been on the front lines in hardly any of, of it. So Mm. what am I hearing my perspective is that I'm mainly hearing from the highest paid people to argue their side. That's who I hear from. Mm. Not the person who's on the front line, who, as you said, like the people who were really in the trenches looking at COVID and man, they're, they're not certain. They're not coming up with certainty, but over here, we're hearing from the loudspeakers. You've got the people who know the most and you've got the people with the loudest voices. Yeah. And, thank uh, you. Exactly. And it's, um, and, and, Sadly, it's the loudest voices that often drown out the people we really ought to be listening to. Um, I, I'm uh, on the board for a nonprofit called Hear Yourself Think. That's mm-hmm. a, it's a wonderful premise, but the, these are uh, the people who run Hear Yourself Think basically um, you know, try to reach across the political aisle and, and say and help us understand the need to actually listen to the quieter voices in the room, because oftentimes they're the ones that we need to to learn from. Where in this aspect, again, of just overall belief and our self, our self image and our own identity, um, it brought me to just the consummate longing of humanity to belong. We mm. want to belong. We feel comfortable at home or maybe with our families or even our group of friends that mm-hmm. may not be great, but you know, kind of the devil, you know, is better than devil, you know, you don't, and, and we belong and we want to yes. belong. And as you, of course you go, you know, show some of the, the, the extremes of, um, you know, 
uh, QAnon and whatever of, you know, people who are there with no thought other than belonging. But I sometimes wonder how many of us are adopting these beliefs just to belong because the flip-flop, but I feel like yeah, 95% of the people you find are going to have some opinion they stand on, on any public issue out there. And my thought, you know, 95% are going to say they got an opinion and I figure only 5% or less actually have the right to, because they've done the work and yet we want to belong. We don't want to become uncertain. We don't want to look ignorant. We want to belong. How much of that comes into these beliefs that we decided to adopt and take as fact. Yeah, I, I think the, the will to belong, the, the need to belong is one of the most powerful forces in our, in our mental lives. I think they shape our lives in, in really interesting ways. Um, and of course, some, a lot of times we will brush aside evidence or even defy obvious truths in order to maintain our belonging, our standing yeah. in, in a community of people we care about. So social psychologists studied the way in which the need to belong um, can sometimes interfere with clear thinking, correct thinking, critical thinking, um, accurate thinking. Um, and, and so there are all kinds of situations where changing your mind risks putting you on the outs with your in-group. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to change that view because then I might lose my community. Yeah. Right. Um, and because fitting in well with your community is a very big, basic psychological need and and was critical to our the survival of our ancestors. Um, we're all more willing to conf be conformist in our yeah. thinking than is often healthy. Sometimes we're we're just so eager to go along and get along that we fall into groupthink and or or the mob mentality, right? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times that can be really um, counterproductive and harmful yeah. so so how do you how do you, I, I i confess in the I, i've thought hard about this and do my best to avoid um thinking that is skewed by my need to belong but i confess in the book that you know i'm a steeler fan pittsburgh steelers are my are my hometown team and i let my tribal solidarity fly on sunday afternoons in football season and that need that sense of belonging with with uh we call it Steeler Nation, the fan base of the team yeah. is really powerful and it's meaningful to me, even though my rational mind tells me spending my Sunday afternoons this way is, is not a good use of my time. <laughs> well, you just offended all the Steelers fans out there. Man, I Andy, I, I was laughing at myself. And it might have been around when I heard your message for the first time. And I found myself sitting with a handful of guys. They're all big outdoors enthusiasts, endurance sports. That's kind of the crowd I hang with. And I talking, understand you're, you've been quite, you're an endurance athlete. Yourself. I, I am. I am. So that's my crowd that I, that's, that's what's where I belong and want to fit in Andy. And, and there's, and there's my story. They're, they're talking about these sunglasses, man. They're the greatest sunglasses, how, how good they are. And, you know, kind of the, anybody who's in the know and hip is, is, is uh, going to have these sunglasses. And I start pulling the sunglasses up, you know, looking at them and thinking, well, I'm gonna have to get some. And then just kind of laugh to myself and realize I hate sunglasses. I don't wear sunglasses. I never have. I've never enjoyed, we were sponsored by sunglasses companies. And I, I just, I just don't like it. I think that they would probably be better for the health of my eyes, but I just don't like looking through why on earth am I pulling up? Cause I want to belong and I'm just chuckling at myself, but to yeah. take that deeper and again, to come back and question, my gosh, how much of the decisions that I make are based on this. Yeah. Desire to belong, to fit in, to be, uh, to be liked, to be loved. I mean, and as you said, that's, that's at the pit of our survival. Yeah. So, so there's a famous experiment in, uh, in psychology where you you get you put a test subject in a room with like five other plants with five um, people who are in on the uh, in on the trick and the first and you ask everybody hey those two lines on the wall are they the same length or are they different lines mm -hmm. and, and they're exactly the same length and the first five people who are all the plants basically say oh the second one's definitely longer than the first one um, and then the test subject comes up and they almost always just go along with the crowd even though they can see plainly that the two lines are the same length. Um, that's how powerful the need to fit in is. And, and, and you'll remember complete strangers. Yeah. Yeah. You'll remember this. Remember the old candid camera elevator 
I don't, I don't know if that's one. That, it's one that I saw as a kid. It always stuck with me. And I was uh, remind me of the specifics. I was I was researching lately and I looked it up and found it again. And it's where they put in. They have, like you said, they have five people or something who are in the know, and then they let a stranger get on. And everybody who's in the know turns the wrong way in the elevator and stands that way. So the, you know, the, the guy comes in at first and starts to turn towards the elevator doors like anybody would, but he kind of looks around and little by little just turns and faces the wrong way. <laughs> and I just remember as a kid looking at it and thinking, what a bunch of idiots, you know, that's not me. And then later in life, realizing I'm in situations sometimes where I don't really know what's going on and I don't want to look like an idiot. And I just kind of conform for no reason other than that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was quite that blatant, but I just man, I understand again. Yeah, the power. And yeah. for us to look at that and again, to can we pull ourselves out of that and question, are we really authentically in and of ourselves uh owning that belief in a, in a, in a way that we've really investigated in, or are we just aligning with where we want to belong? Well, and, and what the psychologists who take, who study evolution um, say is, is that evolution probably implanted self-deluding tendencies mm. that help us fit in. Okay. So uh, our ancestors actually successfully deluded themselves to fit in better and and thus survived better than the non-self-deluding <laughs> um, would-be ancestors that died yeah. off. Um, so we all do a certain amount of engage in a certain amount of self-delusion. We all engage in a certain amount of wishful thinking. It's built into us. But that doesn't mean our, our our views are all equally good because you can modulate these tendencies. You can become self-aware of them. You can take steps to prevent them from skewing your worldview over much. So, so I reject the kind of simplistic false equivalence that says, hey, well, everybody's biased, so there's no point in trying to decide who's right. Right. That That kind of flippant false equivalence excuses a lot of irresponsible thinking. Um, so we need to acknowledge our defects as knowers, as as perceivers, and do our best to, to think straight anyway. <laughs> well, it's interesting when you say, when you talk about self-delusion, because I'm also very interested in the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to belief, we talk about that a lot in again, health and wellness in regards to nutritional supplements. So uh, with the you know investment that I've done, I think it's hard to get the vitamins and nutrients that we need out of even the best diet. And I think that there's value in nutritional supplements. That said, I've never taken any one and immediately or the next day or hardly at all felt like, holy smacks, I feel great. Uh, I, I just haven't. And so I'm spending the money and I'm taking it on faith. Now we can look at advanced diagnostics over time, but even there, you know, there's so many other factors. It's really hard to say oh, that specific thing did it. And so, uh, but then the other part of that then too, is how much benefit do I get from those nutritional supplements I take every day? Because I just think that they should help me. I figure probably as much or, or maybe even more than the quantitative benefit that they actually may or may not give. Just, just the placebo effect. Just maybe the benefiting. placebo. So take that into your discussion on belief that some of the beliefs, if we look at, you know, life giving that outside of the factual aspect, there are benefits downstream. Okay. Let, let's take a, a, an, a supplement that probably most people have, have taken from time to time vitamins. Yeah. Um, expert opinion on whether taking vitamin supplements is really important differs greatly. Now, totally. I, now I imagine that that the benefits somebody uh, somebody who eats a varied di diet full of vegetables probably benefit relatively little from a multivitamin supplement. Yeah. Somebody who lives uh, in a junk food uh, in a world with little access to nutritional food True. might benefit more. I mean, I, I don't really know what the truth is about vitamins. And I, every once in a while I speak, 
buy a bunch of vitamins and then I take them and I ne don't notice anything and think that was a waste. And yeah, that, that's why the compliance stats are about 6% after a few months. It's kind of like new year's resolutions. Everybody starts and you know, a few <laughs> months later, everybody's falling off nutritional supplements, same way you start and the compliance is so little cause you don't see the results, but okay. Th this comes back to uh, perfectly though, the, uh, well, like, what do I take? So I take, um, I take fish oil. I take a uh, probiotic. I take vitamin D and a multivitamin. Why mm -hmm. those four? Because my best friend, Dr. Randy James, medical doctor, functional med medicine expert, who I respect and trust really falls on those as the four pillars. Yeah. But that belies a lot. So why am I taking him? Because of him. Well, I mean, if relying on people who know more than you do is, is generally smart, smart policy. It, it is. But isn't that also where we get dangerous? Because as we are, as we talked about at the at the top of the show, that we are inundated with information, I feel like it's impossible. None of us have the time to go and specifically be on the front lines and study COVID or to really get into the depths of morality on abortion or to be an expert in politics. We don't have to. So we're looking for people to trust out here. Yes. And that's and, where and, we get our belief. Well, and think about, and, and this is really important to the to what makes science successful. So uh, we have scientific specialties. And when, when the astronomers tell us that, that that's a black hole over there and that's a quasar over there, the chemists say, okay, I trust you physicists or you cosmologists, you astronomers, you, you guys are studying that. So I'll, I'll, I'll take it on your authority. Right. But when it turns around and the astronomers wanna know, uh, you know which chemicals are best for your gut, you know, it's the chemists or or the or the biologists who who they turn to yeah. for guidance. Um, and so, so we've watched like division of cognitive labor turn. It used to be there was just one science. In fact, all of science used to be considered natural philosophy, and it was one discipline. And it's gradually fragmented into lots and lots of different specialties. And the division of labor lets us assemble a much more detailed and reliable picture of the world than, than any one of us could assemble on our own, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, uh, relying on the testimony of, of experts is really important. You don't wanna do it blindly, but but especially if, if the advice of your expert friend proves reliable, if, he, he, if he's a generally careful and cautious and thoughtful person, you know, I tend to trust people like that. And so I'm with you here. Here I am. I mean, I'm in the trust business. Um, that is why people listen to this show. That's why our numbers are high enough that we have advertisers and it's a pretty uh, significant, you know, income from that. That's also dangerous. So I have influence, but I am, am I an expert? Now I, I generally contain my shows and topics in areas that I do have a lifetime of experience in, and I would say some level of, of expertise, but if we look at the biggest influencers out there, uh, in, uh, literally out there in the media, look at the biggest influencers, I'm going to say that they have a lot of them have influence, very few of them, what I call an expert in a lot of the areas they're having influence on. I mean, you were on Joe Rogan's show yeah. and I do not know Joe Rogan. I don't listen to the show a lot. I pay attention to him as a top podcaster on planet earth. And I know his influence is dramatic, even in areas where I don't think he's an expert, but he's pulling somebody on and people say, well, Joe had that guy on and seemed to align with him. Right. So that has value to me. It, okay. That's again, dangerous. I would think. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've felt the pull of wanting to be a generalist. So I, I don't mm -hmm. want to become, what did they say about specialists? Somebody who knows more and more about less and less until they know <laughs> everything about nothing. <laughs> I've okay. always pushed back against, you know, becoming, going too far that direction. Yeah. But of course the opposite problem is becoming a, so much of a generalist that, you know, less and less about more and more until you know some, everything about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to Andy with you hit something specific in, in regards to you, even in this aspect of mental immunity, which I've used the word already. And I'll come back to, to me is mental immunity is a, a level of maturity and wisdom. And I really feel like even self-confidence, if I have confidence in, in myself and even in my beliefs, I should have the bandwidth to accept or to at least to consider 
mm-hmm. someone else's and to, to sift that, to put it on the table and let it be uh, dealt with. Okay. So with that said though, mm-hmm. um, and I have a fairly conservative, my, my audience falls on the conservative side mm-hmm. and you, you know, you've, you've mentioned things like evolution during this thing, which some people have a problem with. And we've talked, we, well, we didn't take any sides, but talked about abortion and whatnot. And a good amount of my audience who absolutely firmly believes, you know, one way. And it was interesting that I was reading your book and you have in the beginning, a couple of times, I think I'll just say some very anti-Trump uh, statements and, and a perspective that you hold him. Mm-hmm. And I'm, honestly, the, the layman's terms on this is we're talking about the baby, the baby in the bathwater thing. How many people might hear this show, even in my audience, so I'm speaking to my own listeners here. Hopefully they'll, they won't stop listening to me that you would hear this and think, man, this is really good stuff. I want to know more about this Buy the book. And in the first chapter or two, wherever it is, see a couple statements that you make about uh, Trump that they don't align with and go, I'm out. I'm out. Total dismissal. I've heard from a couple. I've heard from a couple people who had that experience, and okay. um, and actually, so I, I wrestled hard with this question. I, wait, I, I, Andy, I, wait, can, can I can I do something? Please. I was I, with this no, right there. I was going to actually do this because I had the thought of it. This was last night, and I you looked go. your most recent review in Amazon. You've got great reviews. This is mm-hmm. on Amazon. And it says, this is a guy put his name, Dale Sims. He gave you one out of five stars. He Uh said the author watches too much fake news. Any solid ideas are overridden by the author's bias for left-wing ideology. Boom. Mm -hmm. There you go. So Mm -hmm. here's this, this book that you have written so well, so tactfully, you've got support from so many people that I respect. And yet let's just say that this guy took a left-wing, he saw you say something about Trump and he just, and he goes and gives you a, a one, one star out of five to try to dissuade people uh, from reading it. And I think what a terrible disservice, even if you read that and go, well, so sorry, Andy's going to go to hell for not liking Trump, but, uh, but man, he's got, so, God still made him and gave him some great information. I mean, why can't we hold those things? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I could have, I could have toned down some of the political sure. and my, some of my views about politics and religion in the book. And and if I had been purely interested in 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 winning over everybody who reads it, that might have been a, a might have been it would have been a different book. It might have been a better book. Um, part of what I'm trying to do is <clears throat> speak difficult truths to people who need to hear them, even though they really don't want to hear them. Yeah. And. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to lose some supporters by doing that, but I also feel as though I have an obligation to our grandkids' grandkids to begin confronting the the misconceptions and falsehoods that are causing so much harm in our world. Yeah. Now, I think there are many religious views and many conservative political views that do a lot of good in the world. I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, But I also think hard about the way in which belief systems can harden into something that become change resistant. Yeah. And, and how that can arrest people's intellectual growth, their moral growth, when that happens. So I'm trying to offer kind of a guide to opening up your mind so that you can learn and enjoy the heck out of learning and continue to deepen and refine your own wisdom over time. Um, And I think you've done a beautiful job just mm -hmm. to have my vote. Obviously that's why you're here. Um, You have even, even to the, I found a great humility in your stance and in your writing. And it, it brought me into that perspective too, of taking the time to consider somewhat to be not resistant to change and to consider someone's view. And that the consideration, if we go back to, you know, what's, what's the point here. And it's, that's a person, the best way I can love them and and maybe benefit myself is to consider them the arguing itself 
feels like that's the thing that's doing harm. And honestly, I, and I will say, and some of my listeners may not like this, that in regards to Trump specifically, aside from any right or wrong, good, bad, whatever, the, the, the gas that he seemed to throw out into the culture that seemed to cause so much arguing and divisiveness, that alone was really difficult for me. I felt like I just, just please just be quiet. Please just be quiet it, it, that because the arguing doesn't it's causing so much. Your point may be great, whatever, but the way that you're presenting that. And I think that with all of this, and I felt like, again, you're calling us to that. It's not saying you're not saying don't have beliefs. You're not saying anybody's beliefs are wrong. You're saying just, just be considerate of the other person. And even for yourself in being willing to, well, to, to that, to consider. Well, I, and I mean, I think you have to be, if you don't humble yourself and, and don't go through a period of profound sort of the fancy word here is uh is epistemic but if you if you don't become deeply humbled about what you know and yeah. and, and how we know things it's very hard to get to wisdom <laughs> um the the biggest obstacle to wisdom so going all the way back to the beginnings of Greek philosophy, the wisdom traditions from all over the world, they basically say, if your confidence, if your need for approval, if your um, pride is so great that you can't be humbled by new evidence, you're you're miss you're you're on the first off ramp to wisdom, and mm -hmm. and and there's no getting back on it. You yeah. have to humble yourself again and again. And let evidence and and the arguments of others humble you again and again and again if you want to stay on the path to wisdom. Well, I love that line, Andy. I just wrote it down. Deeply humbled in what you know that that is wisdom, and it makes me think of there have been many things in my life where I've looked back later and said, "I'm so grateful that that was revealed to me. I was blind to that. Mm -hmm. I I I got the privilege of exposure to something else." I adopted that it has made my life so better, so much better. And in that I am so desiring to give that gift to somebody else. That posture feels so much different than trying to prove that that's wrong. And I'm right. But this is a, this is something that gifted me, man. I would love to give it to you if it's something you're open to and yeah. it fits you. It may not fit you. It may be the hot pocket that kills you and not that saves you. And <laughs> you got to look at the situation. That that's very kind. Thank you. Um, look, I, it it sounds like we grew up in very different uh, parts of the country. We grew up in very different circles. We hang out with people who who uh, often think very different things. But uh, I count you a kindred spirit who who is on the path to trying to 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 become just a little bit wiser. And and that's a beautiful thing. And I love that. Those of us who care about these things can can reach across the political aisle, reach across the divide between the religious and the secular, and find common ground. I think that's the path. That's th to take. thank you. I appreciate that sentiment and return that and feel great common ground. That's why I have you here. I'm eager for people to hear this and hope that uh, everybody listening has some deep discussions with themselves and with others on. Uh, what you believe in, and as you just said, be deeply humbled in what you feel like you know, and be open to others in finding just what you said, Andy, the common ground, because I think it's so much more than what we would think. So thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being on the show, for your time and the gift of this conversation. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's been a pleasure.